well, welcome to another Off the Shelf board game tutorial video. This week we're going to look at Nations. Nations is a civilization building game with much more concentration on the economical side of things. And you'll definitely notice that if you're familiar with more games such as Through the Ages, or if you want to compare it to Sid Meier's Civilization, the board game, you're going to notice this is much more abstract and less military, but still does an admirable job of simulating an empire growing up from the age of antiquity all the way up to the industrial age. Nations does play one to five players. It does have true solo rules, and it's a very well-designed one-player solo mechanic. You can easily pull it out, play one player, and there's full rules for that. Plays a little bit differently, makes the game a little bit more random, and adds a little bit of a different spin to the game, but definitely keeps the Nations basic mechanics going. Average play time for Nations is going to be about 45 minutes per player, but look at about a minimum of probably about an hour and 15 minutes, even for the solo player game. But it does kind of taper out towards the end. You can probably get a five-player game in, oh, probably maybe two and a half hours, three hours tops. Especially once all the players are very familiar with the rules, familiar with the cards, and know exactly what to expect from their gameplay. The Game of Nations is played over eight rounds, which is broken down into four ages. You have the Age of Antiquity, the Medieval Age, the Age of Renaissance, and the Industrial Age. And the eventual objective is to have the most victory points at the end of the game. Nations does offer quite a few ways to score points. You can score points by having the most heritage, which will give you victory points at the end of every age. You can score victory points for having military, which is going to allow you to conquer certain cards or give you victory points in, at the end of the game. And also allow you to play wars that everybody needs to try to overcome. You can also score victory points by having stability, which shows just how stable your civilization is as it's growing throughout history. But probably the most majority of your victory points are going to come from buying progress cards on the progress board. A lot of the cards that you're going to get as you're going throughout and playing this game are going to give you victory points, whether they're things such as Great Wonders, which can give you victory points at the end of the game, or you can have Military Forces, which will give you victory points at the end of the game. You can also get victory points from having colonies and also from having buildings with workers on them at the end of the game. Now, how all this just works is simple. Every player has their own nation board representing their empire, and there are five different empires that come with the base game. They all have an A and a B side, and while the A sides for all these empires or nations are exactly the same, they do have alternate B sides, which allow them to play just a little bit, a little bit different from each different nation, a little bit different play style, and a little bit different strategies. Players will be required to efficiently use resources while maneuvering their workers on the board to efficiently make sure they're getting the most resources, the most efficient use of the workers, and trying to avoid events that will hamper your empire or your nation's growth throughout history. Can you most efficiently take your nation from the age of antiquity all the way up to the industrial age, score the most points, be the most efficient through every single age? That is Nations, the board game. Before I show you how to play Nations, I just want to cover a few points. First of all, I'm not going to show you how to play the solo game in this tutorial. First of all, the solo game would probably add another 10 minutes onto the length of this video, and I don't think it's going to be worth it at this point. If there's enough demand, and you know, you feel free to leave comments below saying you want to see the rules on how to play the solo game. If there's enough comments for that, I'll upload another video showing how to play a solo game. But in this video, I'm not going to show how to play the solo game, so the dice and these four stacks of cards right here are not going to be used at all. These are for the solo game only, so I'm going to go ahead and pull those off to the side. They're not going to be used at all in this tutorial. Nations itself is a spiritual successor to Through the Ages, and I call it a spiritual successor because, in all honesty, it basically takes Through the Ages and simplifies some things in an effort to make Through the Ages a quicker playing game that isn't such a bear to play with a large amount of players. Now, I'm not going to go back and forth through too many comparisons between Nations and Through the Ages. I may point a few points on that when I do the actual review, but in this tutorial, I'm not going to go too much into that. I'll just basically say that if you're familiar with Through the Ages, a lot of stuff in Nations is going to make sense to you, and it'll pretty much you'll make the connections pretty quickly. Although some things, like I said, have been simplified to prevent this game from being a five-player game that can take anywhere from six to seven hours to play through the entire game. Now, I know there are some people who have mastered the art of getting Through the Ages down in approximately an hour and a half to two hours for a two-player game. I think almost anybody will universally agree that Through the Ages as a four-player game is a three-and-a-half to four-hour exercise. And while it's a great game, it does take a long time to play. And that's one of the nice things about Nations, and I'll cover this more in review, but Nations, even with five players, can be played in about two-and-a-half hours once everybody understands how to play the game. 
Now, additionally, there's a couple other points I want to cover before I go into explanation of the game. First of all, in the rule book, it says that there are basic cards, advanced cards, and expert cards. And the game claims that the first time you play the game, you should play with the basic cards only. I'm going to say baloney. If you have any experience with any of these kind of games, throw in the advanced and the expert cards. They really don't make the game that much more complex. And actually, I think without those advanced and expert cards, the game is a little kind of stale because a lot of the basic cards are, how would I say this nicely, they're pretty much pretty standard basic cards, while the advanced cards and expert cards add a little bit more gameplay and they, in my opinion, make the game a little bit better. So in this tutorial, I've thrown all the expert and the advanced cards in with the basic cards, so you're going to see cards through all three tiers. Again, I don't think it makes a difference. Additionally, I'm playing with the A sides, the boards only, for the player nations. Each nation board is does have a B side, which is a, call it a little bit more complex nation. And while the nations themselves aren't a lot more complex, they do play differently and they require their own independent strategies. And since I'm just trying to show you how to play the basic game, but once you understand the basic game, those advanced nations actually are pretty easy to figure out. So I'm just going to concentrate on the A sides for all three nations. I'm going to show you how to play nations as a three player game. Now in nations the game, every player is going to get their own player board for their own nation. And again, all the A sides are exactly duplicates of each other. And all these A side nations are going to be set up the exact same way. Each player is going to start with five workers in their starting worker pool. They're going to have eight workers that are going to be able to gain access through, possibly by pay playing event cards. Very rare happenstance there. Most likely you're going to get access to these extra workers by making choices at the end of every round of the game. Now, like I said, every nation's player board is going to be set up the exact same way. These are going to be your five initial workers you're going to have access to that you can play on your blue and red cards only. Now, this section of your nation board is for blue and red cards only. You can't put orange cards here, green cards here, or brown cards here. And I'll explain the difference to those when I get to that. But this section is for your red and blue cards only. This is for your orange, orange cards only, green cards only, brown cards only. If you forget, there's nice borders. It makes it very easy to remember exactly which cards go in which section of your nation board. Now, again, these are your eight backup workers. You don't gain access to them until you do one of the specific activities in the game. And then once you have access to these guys, they're pretty much part of your workforce for the rest of the game unless an event causes something else to happen. These are your five starting workers. They're going to be part of your workforce at the very beginning of the game. Plus, each nation is going to start with a couple resources. Every nation is going to start with exactly three food, and food is used for surviving event cards, specifically famine. That's the majority of use for the food cards. Next thing you're going to have is you're going to have coal or rock. Some people like to call it rock or coal, depending on whatever you prefer. Rock or coal is going to be used for moving your workers from your workforce onto your red and blue cards in this section of your board. It's also used for pulling them from one card to another, and there's costs associated with moving your workers around this section only of your nation board. Next thing you're going to have is you're going to have money or gold, whatever you prefer to call it. Money is going to be used to buy progress cards from the progress board, which is going to come from your various decks of progress cards. Now, do note this game is played through four ages. You're going to have access to your age one cards. Then once you move into the third round of the game, you're going to have access to your second age cards. Once you enter the fifth round of the game, you have access to your third age cards. And then finally, the seventh and eighth round of the game, you have access to your fourth age cards. At the end of every second round, you're going to lose access to the prior age. So this age one cards are pretty much going to be around for round one and two, possibly into round three, but not too much. Second, same thing, third and fourth, finally. So by the time you get to the eighth round, you're not going to have any third age cards left on the progress board anymore. And then finally, every player is going to start with a couple of victory points. Every nation starts off with exactly seven victory points. And now, it may sound odd to start off with victory points, but the reason why this happens is because it's actually possible to lose victory points as you're playing the game. Now, at the end of the game, you're going to score victory points in a couple different ways. You're going to score victory points for having workers on red and blue cards. And they're going to show how many victory points are worth right down on the bottom corner of the card. And I'll show you that when we get more into the explanation of the game. This is just a quick overview before I give you the nuts and bolts. But you're going to score victory points for having workers on your red and blue cards. If a worker is not on a red and blue card at the end of the game, he's worth absolutely nothing. So make sure you don't have any workers lollygagging and not earning their keep. The next way you're going to earn victory points is for the total amount of resources you're going to have left at the end of the game. You're going to total up all your food, all your coal, all your gold. And then to that, you're going to add up your total military, your total stability, and your total heritage for your nation. You're going to take that grand total, divide that by 10, and then you're going to add that to your current victory points, plus all the victory points you're going to get for all your guys placed on your blue and red cards, 
plus possibility for wonders and for colonies, and that's going to be your grand score at the end of the game. A good average score, especially for the first couple times you play Nation, is going to be in the 40 to 50 point range. Once you get better, probably about 55 points. If you have a bad string of luck, probably more like 35 victory points at the end of the game. The first thing you need to do when you start playing Nations is you need to set up the scoreboard. Now, this is scoreboard. This is your progress board. These are your nation boards. To set up your scoreboard, the first thing you have to do is you're basically going to have to pick your player order. Now, the interesting thing about nation is the person who goes first is also going to start with the least amount of heritage in their nation. So if you go last, you're also going to start with the most heritage, so that's something to decide if you want to go first, middle, or last when you're playing nations. Now, it's an easy way to do this. Pretty much what you're going to do is if you are the first player, you're going to start with the least amount of heritage. You're going to start with one heritage book. If you're going to be the second player, you're going to start with two books. And finally, if you're going to be the third player, you're going to start off with three books. This is the play order. It's not consistent throughout the game. It's actually going to fluctuate quite a bit as you're playing the game. And I'll show you exactly how that works when we get to that point. But this is the current player order. This is your current heritage of your nation. And this track is going to continue going up. If you manage to make it past 50, you're simply going to take one of these tokens to signify that you pass 50 and you keep on going around the track, getting your total heritage at the end of the game. Now, this track is called your heritage track, but you're going to notice a lot of players will occasionally refer to it as your book track. And the reason why is because the game shows us books and it gets kind of a standard phrase for the game because it does represent books. But basically what your heritage is basically how much renown your civilization is creating throughout history because the people who write the history books are putting your nation in the history books and that's why heritage is represented by history books. The next thing you're going to want to set up is how much architects you have and this is going to be based on the amount of players playing the game. And There's a nice track right here to remind you in case you forget if you're playing the solo rules you start with zero architects all the way up to a five-player game is going to start with three architects. Now I'm setting up for a three-player game, so we see that three and four-player games start with two architects, and architects are represented by these brown discs. And the sole job of architects is to build wonders throughout the game. Now the interesting thing about architects in this game is if there's no architects available, you can't work on any stages of your wonders. And these architects are also one-time use. Now, while this pool is refilled at the beginning of every single round, and again, Nations is played through eight rounds, it's track right through here. Now, don't confu get confused by the turn marker. You'll notice that each age shows three spaces, but it's actually only two spaces. That third space is just a reminder that after you clear an age, after the age of antiquity, you need to remember that you're going to score victory points based on your position on the heritage track. And the way that basically works is you're going to get one victory point for every nation that has less heritage than your current nation. So if, for example, this was the end of the age of antiquity, which would be a bad example here, but just to show you how the mechanic works. This was the end of the age of antiquity. Blue would get one victory point for each nation that has less heritage than blue at the end of this age. So at the end of the age of antiquity, blue would get two victory points for having two nations less. Red would get one victory point for having one nation with less heritage and green would get no extra victory points at the end of the age of antiquity. You actually repeat that process four times. You repeat it at the end of, age, end of the age of antiquity, end of the medieval age, end of the renaissance age, and finally at the end of the industrial age. So again, there's only eight rounds of the game. Don't get confused by the extra space. It's not a 12 round game. This game is played over eight rounds only. Now again, about the architects. The architects are a one-time use. They're used once per age. And again, I'm sorry, once per round. And again, they're going to be refilled up at the beginning of every round. But once you use an architect to work on a wonder, you're actually going to place this architect on your nation board on the wonder to acknowledge that you've worked on a certain stage of that wonder. And then once this worker has done his job, he's not going to return to this pool. He's actually going to be removed back to the reserves. These re reserves cannot be accessed by any players. The only architects you can ever hire are the architects that are on this space of the board. Now again, the amount of architects is going to be based on the amount of players plus the event card. Now every one of these event cards is going to have a different amount of architects on it. Some will have zero, some will have more. For example, this event card is not going to show any architects. So if this was our starting event card, we'd only start the game with two architects. But if we happen to get a card such as this one, we're going to see one additional square, which means this round is going to start with three architects. And I'll explain the event cards in just a moment. just want to explain the rest of the board. 
Now, Nations does have a really cool thing that's going to be reminiscent of the original Sid Meier's Civilization PC games. If you ever play them, this is going to be really familiar for you. If you ever played Sid Meier's Civilizations, you know that you can play Civilization at various difficulty levels. You remember there's a Chieftain, a Prince, a King level, and I think there's like five or six different levels. I haven't played in a little while, but somebody will correct me if I'm wrong here. Basically, the way Nations is going to work is when you start playing, you get to decide how difficult of a game you want to make this for yourself. Now, if you want, every single player can play at the Chieftain level, or if you happen to have one player who's played Nations many times or teach the game to a couple of new players, the person who's played a few times can make the game a little more difficult on themselves by choosing a higher difficulty level. So in this example, Red and Green will both be playing at the Chieftain level, and Blue, who happens to have some experience with playing Nations, can play at the King level, making the game a little bit more challenging for themselves, kind of a nice little touch. Now, I don't want to confuse things, so all three of our players in this instructional game were all going to be playing at the Chieftain level. Now, there's two other tracks you need to be aware of in Nations. The first is going to be your Stability track. Next one is going to be your Military track. Now, every single Nation is going to start with exactly zero Military and zero Stability. Now there's two spots left on the progress board right here, and I'm not, I'm sorry, over on the scoring board here. I'm not going to go over them until I explain them quite at the time when it makes sense to do so, but the first space is going to be for your wars, and then your second space is going to be for your event cards. Now at the beginning of the game when you set it up, nobody knows what exactly events are going to be fall or nations at the beginning of the game, so we don't actually put a card here in the event spot. In the beginning of the game, the event spot and the war spot should both be empty. So basically you should have your zero military, zero stability, architects based on the amount of players, your difficulty level, round zero, books in the order of your scoring, and then your scoring board is set up. One final note on the scoreboard though is reference the stability track. Now you notice the stability track goes from minus one, minus two, minus three to minus infinity. And while there's a minus infinity space on the board, you actually keep track of your actual value of your negative stability. So if you happen to be at minus 10, while your token will be on the minus infinity track number you're going to always remember that your actual stability is at negative 10 and hopefully your nation never gets to minus 10 because that means in your, you're in a lot of trouble now it's very important to differentiate that aspect of the stability track because there's gonna be a lot of cards in this game that are going to say any nation with the least stability is going to suffer this negative effect now the interesting thing about nations if your nation is in revolt whether it's at minus one stability or minus 20 stability, you're still considered to be in revolt, which means that you are the least stable nation. So it's a very, very important thing to understand because this is a mistake a lot of players can make. If a card ever says least stable civilization suffers a certain effect, that's going to affect every single nation that happens to be in revolt, not just the green, even though they have less stability than the blue. The fact that both of them are in revolt shows that they both have the least amount of stability so any card that says least stability would actually hit both of these players in this example. You also want to make sure that you don't neglect the stability of your civilization because stability can help mitigate the damage from war. Stability is also going to help you get your victory points at the end of the game because remember you're going to add up your stability to your current heritage plus your military plus your remaining resources. Divide that by 10 to get your extra score victory points at the end of the game. Stability is also going to help you avoid negative events. Once you set up the scoring board, the next thing you need to set up is your progress board for this game. Now, if you look at the progress board, you're going to notice that there's a number of spaces available for you to place your progress cards. And each space is going to have a number depending on how many players you're playing, and that's going to tell you how many maximum cards you can play. So, for example, in a three-player game, you can go all the way up to this line for progress cards, which means these two rows are not accessible. They're not going to be used. If you're playing with four players, you can go up to this line, and you can see there's a four plus to remind you of that fact. Playing a five-player game, you'd fill up every single one of these slots on every single one of these rows with progress cards. Now, since we're playing a three-player game, we're going to fill up our progress board all the way up to the three-plus player mark in every single one of these rows. And since we're in the Age of Antiquity, which uses the Age 1 cards, we're going to start with our first progress Age 1 cards, and we're going to use those to fill up our progress board. Once our progress board has been set up based on the amount of players, and again, we're playing a three-player game, so we definitely want to stop where it says three-plus players, these two rows will never be used during this game. If we play a four-player game, we will go up to this row, five-player game, etc. Two-player game actually stops right here at this row, so this row right here would actually be removed. 
You notice that the progress board has various costs on each side of the board. If you want to purchase a card from this row, it's going to cost you three gold. If you want to purchase a card from this row, it's going to cost you two gold. Finally, if you want to buy a card from this row, you'll see it costs you one gold. I'll explain that when I explain how the actual game plays. Once you set up your scoring board and you set up your progress board, each player gets to pick their nation they want to play. However you wish to decide, if you're all playing A sides, it really doesn't matter. If you're playing B sides, you'll have to figure out some random method on figuring out how each player is going to pick their nation. Now there's a couple of important concepts to understand about your nation board. First of all, every space on your nation board is a finite space. So for example, if you happen to get an advisor early in the game and you want to get a second advisor, you have to actually get rid of this advisor and place them with the new advisor. Again, unless you have a special ability that breaks some of these rules, and again, there are cards that allow you to do this. For example, there's a wonder that allows you to have multiple advisors even though you only have one space. Don't want to get ahead of myself here though. But just to emphasize the point, each space is a finite resource. So if you have an advisor and you want to replace them, you're going to have to get rid of the old advisor. You lose all benefits he gave you in the past, and he's actually discarded and removed from the game. It's the same thing for the colony space. If you have two colonies and you want to get a third colony, you have to remove your old colony, remove it from the game, replace with the new colony down. Your spaces for your wonders are finite. Once you've used up all those spaces, you want to get extra wonders. You have to get rid of one of your current wonders and replace it with a wonder that just came on the board. Now, cards have to go in their specific section of the boards. For example, you can't put a colony over here in the wonder section. You can't put a wonder over in the advisor section. It should be obvious, but I just want to make sure I state that. Each section of the board is for its own type of cards. You can only put those kind of cards in those specific sections. Now, the only caveat to that, though, is this section of the board where you have your blue, which are your building cards, and your red, which are your military cards. Now, the best way to imagine your civilization board is to imagine that this row of blue and red cards is just pretend that each one of these spaces is an actual card on your board. They just happen to pre-print them to save a little bit of setup time and make it a little bit easier for you to start playing the game. Pretend that these cards are blank and that you actually laid these cards out and you understand what I'm about to explain. Anytime you purchase a blue building card or a red military card, you have to place it in this section of your board. Now the nice thing is you can place a card down in one of these sections. Once you play a card down, it replaces the prior card and this card below it, once I place that there, is gone for the rest of the game. Even if for some reason I lose this card here and I have to discard it, this farm does not come back. This farm is gone because I've replaced it with this lighthouse. And even if I lose this lighthouse, farm is gone, it'll never come back. Now if I happen to get rid of this lighthouse and replace it with this legionary right here, and then somehow I get rid of that legionary, again this farm doesn't come back, that'll be a blank space for the rest of the game. So you have to make sure you're very smart about how you're putting down these extra buildings and these extra military cards. Additionally, you can actually get rid of prior cards to the point where you may not have access to certain things. Now, if I wanted to, if I bought this lighthouse card from the progress board, I can actually place it on top of my military, and that means until I manage to buy another military card, I have zero access to military for the rest of the game until I buy another military progress card. Now, if I get a military progress card, I don't have to actually put it on this space. I can get rid of my temple if I don't like my temples. And then I can get another military card later on if I like and get rid of my quarry. And now I have an elephant and a legionnaire and a lighthouse and a farm and a caravan. But that's my basic nation board. And again, if I lose the lighthouse, the axemen don't come back. If I lose the legionary, the quarry doesn't come back. Sorry, quarry. And if I lose the elephant, the temple doesn't come back. So pretend these are actual physical cards on the board, and once they've been replaced, they're gone for the rest of the game. Additionally, you can only have one wonder under construction at a time. There's a space that says wonder under construction, it goes right here. Now to build your wonder, what you're going to do is you're going to discard rock or coal resources to buy architects. And again, architects have to be available. If there are no architects available in the purchase spot, you can't work on stages of your wonder. Now, if it's your turn, simply you discard as many resources as it says to work on one stage of wonder. For example, work on the first stage of the pyramid costs you two coal. You simply discard two coal to purchase one architect who's going to be placed on top of your wonder to let you know you worked on one phase of your wonder. Now, some wonders will cost two architects, some will cost three, and it can vary depending on the, arc, on the wonder. And they also have varial rewards and penalties once they've been built. Now the thing about a wonder is you can only work on one wonder at a time. 
If you happen to get a second wonder and the first wonder has not been built, you're actually going to remove it, place a new wonder down, and any architects that already begun work on that prior wonder are going to be removed, and they pretty much have gone to waste. And then there's one more concept to understand about each culture's nation board. These are your actual workers that are available to place on your buildings and your military cards. These workers down here on this section of your board are best way to consider them as your backup workers. They're not actually part of your nation until you've done something to actually add them to your workforce. And once you've added these workers to your workforce, they're going to add a permanent drain to your nation for the rest of the game. Now the drain can be extra food that you need to spend every round, or the drain can be a permanent drain on the level of your stability that's going to affect you for the rest of the game. So the more workers you add to your workforce, the more of a drain they're going to cause on your nation for the rest of the game because they're now part of your workforce and they're going to stay part of your workforce until an event, and there are a few events that can do this, or something will come up that will force you to remove one of your workers from your workforce and return them to your backup worker section. Now when a card costs you or tells you to remove a worker from your workforce and return them to your backup, you can place them back at either section, it doesn't matter. So if you think the drain or stability is too great, you can place your worker back here. Think the drain on your food stores are too great, you can place them back here. It's up to you. Now that you understand the basics, I'm going to go ahead and show you exactly how Nation plays. Now once you set up your player board or scale board and your progress board, and each player has set up each one of their Nation boards, with their workers and their beginning resources, each player in reverse player order is going to have to make an important decision. And the important decision is, are they going to take a couple of free resources and add them to their empire, or are they going to take a permanent worker and add them to their workforce, which is going to add a permanent drain to their empire for the rest of the game. Now the amount of free resources you're going to get is going to be based on the difficulty level you choose. If you're playing on Chieftain level, you get four resources, and they all have to be the same resource, but you get to choose which one of these three resources you want. You get four ore, four gold, or four food. If you're playing on Prince, there'll be three of each, or three, but you got to pick one, all the way down to Emperor, which is only going to give you one, and that shows you how much more difficult you can get as you raise the difficulty level of the game. So since we're all playing on Chieftain level, every player starting in reverse player order needs to make the decision. They can either take one worker, and permanently add that worker to their workforce, and that's going to add a permanent drain to their empire for the rest of the game, or they can take a permanent amount of resources and add that to their board, and that'll be an additional resources that they can spend immediately, and they take any one of these three resources and add them to their nation board. Of course, you have to make sure you do that in reverse order, not exactly how I did that. Blue would have made the decision first, red, then green would have had to have made that decision because you're going to do it in reverse player order. Once every person has decided they're going to take the free resources or the free work, the next thing they need to do is they're going to decide exactly what event is going to come into play. You're simply going to flip the top core card of the event deck based on the age you're currently in. Since we're in the first age, the age of antiquity, we're going to take the top card from this age deck. Now there's 12 cards in each one of these decks. You're only going to use two from each deck, so it's going to have a lot of replayability and a lot of variety to the game. Once you flip over your event card, you're going to see if you're going to add any additional architects to the starting architect supply. And there's going to be one square or zero squares, depending on how many additional architects you're going to add. This example, we're going to add two additional architects. So we know in this first round of this game, we're going to have four total architects available for our three nations to try to purchase to build wonders. After all this is done, this basically ends the maintenance phase, and we now enter the actual action phase where the players actually get to take their actions. Now the way Nations works, and this is going to be familiar with players if you ever played Eclipse, is each player is going to get the opportunity to take one action, and they're going to pass to the next player. Each player is going to take one action in turn until they decide that they don't want to take any more actions anymore. Then they're simply going to decide that they're going to pass. Once a player has passed, they can't take any more actions that turn, and it's up to the other players to keep taking actions. And they're going to continue taking actions until they also decide to pass. Once all three players, or all the players, depending on how many, many players you're playing, have decided to pass, you're actually going to end the player action phase. During the player action phase, you have one of three options that you can take. The first option you can take is you can buy a progress card. And to buy a progress card, you simply spend as many gold as it takes based on what row that progress card is in. So if you want to buy a progress card from this row, cost you three gold. 
Want to buy a progress card from this row, it's going to cost you one gold. Alternately, if you don't want to buy a progress card, you can move one of your workers onto one of your spaces on one of the red military spaces and one of the blue building spaces. And it's going to cost you amount of coal to move one of your workers onto one of these spaces depending on the card. And generally the cost of moving a worker onto one of these cards is going to be anywhere from one to four and it generally matches the current age you're in. Most of the first age cards are going to cost you one coal to move a worker onto them. Most of the second age cards are going to be two coal, third age cards are going to be three coal, and finally the fourth age cards are generally going to be four coal. Now that's not 100% constant, there's a few cards that change that, but the vast majority follow that standard. And to see how much it's going to cost you to move a worker onto a card, you simply look in the lower left hand corner, and it's going to have a number next to a coal symbol, and that's actually how much coal you have to discard to move your worker onto that space. Now if I move my worker onto this space right here, it's going to cost me one coal, which I'll discard, and then at the end of this round, during the production phase, I'm going to produce these resources. Now these cards have two kinds of different kinds of numbers. Now the first thing you have to understand about nations, and if you're an accountant, don't go into fits over this, but in nations, red is good, black is bad, so you want to be operating in the red, not in the black. Again, if you're an accountant, try not to go into fits here. Additionally, you're going to notice that some numbers are going to be in a circle, some numbers are going to be in a square. Now, if a number is in a square, it's going to take effect immediately. If a number is in a circle, it's going to come into effect during the production part of the resolution phase. So just remember that red is good, black is bad, circles happen during the production phase, squares happen immediately. So if you put a worker on a space that happens to have a number in a square, for example, military, as soon as I put a worker on this space, I'm going to gain two additional military, and I'm going to have that military as long as this worker is on that space. And then since it's a square, it's going to take effect immediately. Since I put a worker on the quarry right here, I don't have any squares of production. Now your production is at the top of the card. I am going to produce one coal, one gold when we come to the production phase, as long as this worker is still here when that phase happens. If this worker happens to move from here to the temple before the end of the production, or I'm sorry, before the production phase, I'm actually not going to produce those resources. You're basically going to produce as many resources based on however many workers happen to be on that space during the production phase. And again, squares happen immediately. So if I have a worker here, I'm going to get one to my stability. That's going to happen instantly. If I have a worker here, that's going to be two military. And then these are the only two things going to happen immediately. These two, these three workers are going to do production during the production phase. And again, I'm only going to produce those things as long as workers are on that space. If I happen to spend one coal to move this worker from a military onto this temple space, my military is immediately going to go down by two points because I moved off of that space, which is going to put me back down at zero military. And again, I won't get these extra resources until the production phase. If I happen to move that worker over here from this military space to the caravan space, my military would go down too, but I'm going to gain one more to my stability because, again, a square happens immediately. The final option a player can do on their turn is to hire an ar architect. Now, you can only hire an architect if two things are true. One, there has to be an architect available to hire, and two, you have to have a wonder to work on. You can't just hire an architect to try to screw another player out of access to architects because you see they're working on a wonder. If you don't have a wonder to work on, you can't hire architects. And if you happen to have a wonder you're working on and there's no architects available to hire, nothing you can do. You can't work on that wonder during this turn. So basically you have three options you can do on your turn. You can buy a production card, you can move a worker onto one of your production spaces, or you can buy an architect who works towards building a wonder. Once all players have decided to pass on their turn, you're going to end the action phase and you're going to move on to the resolution phase. Now, for the first thing you're going to do for the resolution phase is, depending on where your workers happen to be, you're going to produce resources. And you're going to start, basically all players are going to do the production phase at the exact same time, which is very nice. It's going to speed up gameplay. You're basically going to take however many workers you have on each space times the amount of resources each worker on that space is going to produce, and that's going to give you those resources. So, for example, having one worker and another worker on this space is going to give me two books, plus one gold, this worker on this space, while he gives me two military, permanent bonus while I have him there, is going to cost me one food every single production phase. This worker right here is going to produce one coal and one food. This worker right here is going to give me permanent one stability, and he's going to produce one gold. 
Now you can produce these resources in a specific order. First, you're gonna add up your total gold production. We're gonna see in this example, I'm producing one, two, plus one more, I'm producing a total of three gold. So my nation would gain three gold. And these additional nations would do the same thing, add up all their gold. Then we're gonna add up the total amount of food that we're producing. We're gonna see that we're producing minus one food because we have one worker on the axman space, but we're also producing one food because we have a worker on a farm, which is gonna be a total wash for a total net gain of zero food. Then we're gonna figure out how much coal we're, we're producing by looking at how many workers we have. We have one worker producing one coal. So we'll take one additional coal. And then we're gonna figure out just how many books or heritage our nation is producing. Now our nation is producing two heritage because we have two workers here. So since we're the red player, we're gonna advance two spaces on the heritage track. And then once we've done all that, we're gonna go ahead and figure out the new player order. Now player order is gonna be based on military and ties are gonna be broken by stability. So the new player order is gonna be based on the current military standings for all the nations. Since red in this example has two military, they're gonna be the new player one. And then blue and green are tied for military strength so we're gonna figure out which one of them happens to have the higher stability. Now, for example, blue happened to have the higher stability, player order would change like this, but since they're both the exact same military, they're at the exact same stability, their player order would stay the same in reference to each other. The next thing you need to do is resolve any wars if a war is purchased. Now, in this game, a war is only gonna happen if a player buys a war during the action phase on their turn. And the way you do a war is if a player purchases a war from the production track, it's basically gonna be added to the war slot. And the player who bought the war is gonna dictate the strength of the war. Now when a war is purchased, this black disc is gonna be placed at the level of the player who bought the war. So if red bought this war, we'd have a level two war that's gonna have to be factored for this game. Now if red wasn't quick enough and blue happened to buy the war before red had a chance to do that, this war would actually be set at a level zero, basically lowballing the war, making sure that nobody's affected by this war. And I'll explain that when I go over my review, but just know that anybody is free to buy a war at any time they want, and the level of the war is gonna be set based on the level of the person, their military strength, when they buy the war. If in our example, red happens to buy the war when he had two military, this war is gonna be a level two war and any player who does not have at least the level of this war or higher in the military is gonna suffer the negative effects of the war. Now every single war is gonna have two negative effects. The first negative effect can be reduced by your stability. The second negative effect, nothing can prevent it. Now the first negative effect is gonna be down here. It's gonna show that every nation who does not have at least that much military is gonna suffer that negative effect. Now don't forget that if red buys this war at level two and then somehow their military drops down, even though they bought this war, they can still be affected by it. So wars aren't really player versus player, it's all players versus the war. So if you buy a war, make sure you keep your military strength up because if it drops, you can be hit by your own war. Now in this example, this war is gonna cost every person who doesn't have at least two military to lose three gold. Now this can be reduced by stability and every point of stability is going to reduce the amount of loss that you're going to suffer from the war. So in this example, if blue happened to have three stability, green happened to have zero stability, in our example, blue is going to lose zero gold because their stability counteracts the amount of lost gold, but green is going to have to lose three gold from their empire, which they're going to have to discard immediately. Then additionally, every single player who doesn't have an equal strength to the war is also going to lose one victory point. Now stability does not counteract that loss of victory points. So in this example, blue and green both have to discard a victory point which is gonna be lost from their empire. This is why sometimes if you're going for a low military strategy and a high stability strategy, sometimes it's worth it to buy a war, even if your military happens to be at zero, just to guarantee that you're never gonna suffer the negative effects of a war. Now remember, anybody can buy a war. All they have to do is buy it from the progress board. And as soon as they do, the war is gonna be equal to the strength of the person who purchases the war right when they buy that war card. After war has been handled, we're finally gonna move on to the event card. Now the event card has two sections on it. Both sections are gonna happen from the top first, then you're gonna handle the bottom section. Now event cards, you need to understand a certain concept about nations of the game. There's two concepts in nations. There's least and then there's most. 
Anytime a card says least, all players who have least of whatever it says are going to suffer the effects. If a card says most, only the nation who has the most of whatever it says is going to get the bonus. If two players are tied for the most, neither is actually going to get the bonus. So remember, least affects everybody. Most only affects the person who actually has the most. If nobody has the most of whatever it says you need, then nobody's going to get that bonus. So an example for this event card right here, it's going to say that the person, the empire with the least amount of military is going to lose three gold. Now in our example, blue and green just happen to be tied for the least amount of military. So both of them in this example are going to lose three gold. Next thing we're going to have here, it says most abilities can gain four or, or others can, all others are going to lose three food. This is actually one of the more unique event cards in the game. This one actually says that if you have the most ability, you have a choice. You can either allow yourself to gain four or permanently added to your nation, or you can cause every other single nation in the game who does not have the most ability to lose three food. So if this happened to be our current event card, Blue would have a decision since they have the most stability and nobody's tied for most, so they're gonna get the bonus. They can either take four ore and add that permanently to their empire, or they can force red and green to each discard three food. Now I'm gonna go ahead and choose a second option so I can show you the final thing, famine, and also show you negative scoring for lack of resources. Now after you handle those two levels of the event card, the final thing you need to do is you need to handle the famine. Now the famine is going to be listed at the top of the nation card, and it's going to be a random number. The lowest is, I think, zero. The highest, I think, is a seven that you lose. But basically, every nation needs to discard that much food. And you're basically going to look at however much food you happen to have, and you're going to discard that much food. Now if you don't have as much food as you need to discover, discard, and this also happens for any other resource. Anytime you cannot discard as many resources as the game tells you to discard, you have to start discarding books or heritage on a one-for-one -one basis to make up for the difference in the resources you lack. Now, in our example here, blue happened to have three food easily to discard, which more than covers the different amount of food that you need to have. But green does not have any food to discard, and red does not have any food to discard. So since they don't have the amount of resources to discard, they each need to lose one victory point for not having a resource that they need to discard. And that's gonna be a permanent loss on victory points. So that's why you always wanna make sure that you have resources. And then they need to discard books to make up the difference. Now, green is gonna get double hit here because unfortunately they don't have any heritage to discard to make up the difference also. So since they don't have any heritage, they're gonna lose an additional victory point and then they need to start finding resources from somewhere else. Now they do happen to have one heritage, so they can go ahead and discard that one heritage, now they need to get rid of two other resources from another source. They're gonna go ahead and pick their ore to cover the remaining two resources, and that's gonna cover their loss. And again, since they didn't have the amount of books, they need to lose that additional victory point. So just lacking that food for a green player hit them twice. They lost a victory point for not having the food, then they lost a victory point for not having the heritage to come up with the one shortfall they had. Now the nice safety net for this is that you can never lose more than one victory point per round per resource lack. Now there's four resources in the game. There's coal, there's food, there's gold, and then there's heritage. So you can never lose more than four victory points on a round because you never lose more than one victory point per resource deficit. It's kind of a nice safety net, but losing four victory points can hit you pretty hard. Once you've handled the famine, you're pretty much done with that end of the round. Now, if it happened to be every second round, which is the end of each age, you're going to score and you get an additional amount of victory points based on how many heritage points you have compared to your opponents. Again, you get one heritage point for every nation that has one or is below you in the current heritage track. So in this example, red's going to get two victory points because red happens to have two nations with less heritage than them. Blue is gonna get one victory point because they have one nation with less heritage than them. Green is not gonna get any victory points because they don't have any nations with less heritage than them, especially since they're currently at zero heritage. And again, that's only done every second round at every B level of every nation. After that's done, you're pretty much finished your round. You're gonna start the new round by simply advancing the round marker. You're going to take all progress cards from row two and progress cards from row three. They're going to be removed from the board. So if they weren't purchased, they're basically gone. There's no way to get them ever again. 
then all progress cards in row three are going to be moved down to row number one. And then based on whatever current age you're in, you're going to grab that deck of cards and start adding that and filling out the progress board. So if we move to the medieval age, we'd grab our second age cards and we'd fill up our progress board again. All the way across, making sure we're filling up our rows. Then we go back on to choosing if we want to take an additional worker, extra resources, and go on and do the additional rounds. Nations are going to be played. Continue over that until you reach the end of the final eighth round, where you're going to get your final scores, add everything up, and find out who is the winner of Nations. Now, there's just a couple quick concepts to help you understand how to play Nations just a little bit better. When you're playing Nations, you need to understand that on all the red and blue cards, the bottom is going to be the cost for using the card. The top is going to be the resources that are produced. On all your brown, your green, and your orange cards is actually the opposite of that. All your bonus resources are actually going to be listed on the bottom of the card, so don't get confused. Orange cards, green cards, brown cards, your bonus is on the bottom. Blue and red cards, your bonus is on the top, generally. On the blue and red cards, the cost to move workers onto those spaces is going to be on the bottom. And additionally, any victory points you can get for those cards is also going to be on the bottom. Additionally, colony cards, when you buy them, you have to have a certain amount of minimum military to purchase a colony card. And if you don't have the amount of military, you can't actually spend the gold to buy that progress card. And the amount of military it takes is going to be listed on each card. It's going to be equal to or greater than that amount of military. So, for example, to get this colony, add this colony to your empire, you need to have at least six or higher military. And if you don't have at least that amount of military, you cannot purchase that colony. The nice thing, though, is once you purchase a colony, even though you lose the military because you move your workers to other spaces, you don't lose access to that colony. You just need that amount of military to conquer that space, and then for the rest of the game, as long as you possess that colony, it's going to give you that amount of resources for the rest of the game. And it can give you anything from resources to military to stability or gold or production or anything like that. But once you've got that colony added to your board, it's a permanent resource gain for the rest of the game. The additional thing is going to be the battle cards. Now, battle cards are really interesting. You can buy a battle card only if you have at least one worker on a military unit. Now, you have to have at least one worker on a military unit. You can't have a card such as this colony that gives you two military. You have to actually have a worker on a military unit. If you don't, and you even just, though you have this colony that gives you two military, and you don't have a worker on one of these military cards, you cannot buy one of these battles. If you do buy one of those battles, the battle, the battle card is going to give you amount of resources based on the number on this military card. Now, this number is not multiplied by however many workers you happen to have on that military card. It's a set value, and this number can be anywhere from 2 all the way up to, I believe the highest one is 11 or possibly 10. And that's going to be how many resources you can permanently add to your empire. And you get to decide when you purchase that battle card how many resources you're going to get and which resource you're going to choose. You can't mix it up. You pick one resource and you permanently gain that. So if, for example, to buy this battle right here, it's going to cost me however much money depending on which row it's currently in. So if this battle card happened to be in row number two, I can buy it for two gold. And then once I buy it, I'm going to find out however many military value I have on my current military card. And it's going to be, in this example, two, and I'm going to get that amount of resources that I choose. I can either get two stability, I'm sorry, two books, I can get two food, or I can get two ore. Can't mix and match. I can pick one of those three. And then this card is actually discarded. It's basically a one-use card. The other one-use card is going to be your Golden Age cards, and they're going to give you one of two things. You're going to basically spend the amount of gold it costs to buy it that golden age card depending on what row it came from then you have a choice you can either get whatever it offers you or you can discard a certain amount of resources for permanent victory points and the basically these are going to be one resource for one victory point in the age one cards all the way up to the age four golden age cards which can be four resources for one victory point so these golden age cards are much easier to get the victory points in the beginning and then once you get towards the end, you're probably going to start getting just the resources from them because they're pretty expensive unless you have a really good production. I think I've explained enough to you how to play Nations. I'm going to go ahead and set everything up for a three-player game. I Hopefully, I've given you good enough instructions on how to play the game. I know this is basically one of those games that's going to look a lot more simpler once you've actually seen and played. So again, I'm going to clean everything up, set up the game for a three-player game of Nations. I'm just going to go through and show you how to play Nations.